This is the Hamsel Dial version 2. It's a class of 3D printed programmable controllers for your PC. As you might have guessed from the name, it was originally inspired by the Microsoft Surface Dial, but it's become much more than that. And in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you everything that went into the development of these devices. So I designed the first version of the dial a little more than a year back, and I've used it religiously ever since. I learned a lot from using the dial so much, and a few of you guys also made some really helpful suggestions on the features you like included with the dial. I took all that information and I put it into the development of the version 2. When I started the development, I had very specific goals in mind. First, I had to create multiple versions of the dial to cater to different types of users. Secondly, I had to make the dial operate in both wired and wireless mode. My third goal was to make the dial extremely easy to use, even for people with zero programming skills. This largely meant I had to develop a companion app for the dial, which I did. The last goal I had was to give the dial context awareness which simply means having the dial automatically switch its configuration to match whatever software you're using it with. So the dial can be programmed to do different things within different applications. Here you notice that the LEDs on the dial changes as soon as I switch the active application on my computer. You'll also notice that the dial performs different operations within the different applications. This feature is one of many enabled by the companion app and I will be making a separate video for all the software that controls the dial and that includes the Arduino code on the dial itself. In this video, I will mostly focus on all the hardware features. So, as you can see, I ultimately created four variations of the dial, each with its own defining hardware feature. First is the base variant. This is very similar in design and features to the first version of the dial, but with some key upgrades like the inclusion of the NRF24 for wireless communication and a USB Type-C port for wired operation. It also has a higher resolution encoder and the build process has been greatly simplified. The macro variant has all the same features as the base variant with the addition of five mechanical switches. The third variant is designed for people that do 3D and CAD related work. It has a five axis space navigator built into the top section. I'll be describing this feature in more details later on in the video. This variant also has an additional encoder in the bottom section. The last but certainly not the least is the absolute variant. This is essentially a combination of all the features in the other variants. This is just me putting all the different hardware features I developed for the Hamsville dial into one device. A lot of the hardware is shared between all four variations of the dial. So for this video, I'm going to focus on explaining how all the hardware features work and not on the variants themselves. The first part we're going to take a look at is the electronics. But before I get to that, I'd like to talk to you about this video's sponsor, GLCPCB. 
All the boards you see before you were made by GLC PCB and they all turned out perfectly, exactly as designed. There are no manufacturing defects, no deviations in the dimensions or shape of the boards. Considering how all the boards are custom shaped and designed to fit into specific parts, I think they did a wonderful job. If you have a PCB project of your own, I can honestly recommend GLC PCB. You simply upload your Gerber files and submit it with all your board preferences. Your board design will be professionally checked by engineers for design errors and then put into production all within 24 hours. Depending on where you live, you can get your boards manufactured and in your hands in less than a week. I'll link to the website in the description. A huge thanks to JLCPCB for sponsoring this video. These are all the boards I designed for the dial. You have the main board, which holds most of the important parts of the entire circuit. Next to that is the USB Type-C power distribution board. This board handles LiPo charging, voltage conversion, power distribution, and it also holds the LEDs that provide the underglow on the base of the dial. Next is the macro keyboard with soldered on mechanical keys and addressable LEDs. Next to that is the secondary encoder board. This has just a few all effect sensors on it. It's used for the space navigation feature. More on that later on in the video. Then you have the perforated capacitive touchpad. The holes are there to allow the LEDs from the main board to shine through. This is how the dial achieves this cool backlit look on the surface. The last board is a wireless adapter. Like the main board, it also has a NRF24 circuit. This is how a two-way wireless communication is achieved between the dial and the PC. So the wireless adapter plugs into the computer and relays all the commands from the dial to the computer. Another thing these boards have in common is they both have microcontrollers capable of emulating HID class devices like your mouse and keyboard. The main board uses the more powerful SAMD 21G chip, while the adapter uses the Atmega 32U4. On the main board, there is also a motion tracking IC and two comparator ICs for the magnetic rotary encoder that's featured in all the variations of the dial. If you've seen my previous video, then this rotary encoding setup will look familiar to you. If not, I'll link to the video in the description. This is an identical setup, only with an higher base resolution of 80 steps per revolution, which also goes as high as 4000 steps per revolution. Again, the previous video will tell you all you need to know about this encoder setup. It's really cool stuff, you should check it out. Another feature that's common to all the dial variants is the capacitive touch. Like the first version, the dial has a capacitive touch surface with four main input types. Tap, double tap, short press and long press. Plus a newly added super long press that's reserved for special dial operations like disconnecting and putting the dial into sleep mode. All these inputs are backed by a really satisfying haptic feedback provided by a coin type vibration motor embedded inside the dial. The capacitive touch is also a topic I've discussed in previous videos. The next hardware feature I want to talk about is the macro keys found on the literally named macro key variant and also the absolute variant. You have five mechanical keys. These are soldered on Garron clear switches. Each key is connected to an interrupt on the SAMD 21G chip. Each key has its own addressable LED and each key registers tap and hold as separate inputs, making a total of 10 mappable macro inputs. The last hardware feature I developed for the dial is the space navigation feature. For this, I wanted to have multiple axes of movement on the top section of the dial, the same part that holds the encoder and the capacitive touch. So I used the MPU6050 motion tracking IC to provide the yaw, pitch and roll. 
I then developed a separate system for providing sliding movements parallel to the XY plane. If you take a look at the main board, you can see the MPU 6050 is placed in the center of the dial. So when I tilt the top section of the dial, the same motion is transferred to the chip. This gave me the tilt movement for the dial, but I still needed sliding movement on the XY plane. For this, I came up with this system of magnets and all effect sensors. The idea here was to place an all effect sensor on the X and Y axis with each sensor positioned between two magnets with alternating poles. This arrangement gives me linear values for both axes. So translating these values in the code allows me to know the position of the top section of the dial on the XY plane. Another thing I took into consideration is the different orientations the dial can be used in. Realistically, a device like this won't always be used in the same position or orientation. I personally move mine around depending on the application I'm using it with. So if you really think about it, say the x-axis on the dial is fixed here and I change the dial's orientation which can happen either intentionally or otherwise. The dial's axis will also shift, causing confusion because now where you would instinctively expect to be hop or left or right has also shifted. This is not a very nice user experience. Luckily, the MPU 6050 also registers your. So using the your value from the chip, I implemented a feature I called adaptive space navigation. What this feature does is it tracks the angular deviation of the dial and then moves all the axes in software to match that deviation. So regardless of the orientation you put the dial in, you can expect that hop will always be hop. And the same goes for all other directions. Another huge part of the space navigation feature is the spring-loaded mechanism. This allows the top section of the dial to move in all the required directions. It also connects the top section of the dial to the bottom, and it holds the magnets for the sliding movement on the X and Y axis, which I described earlier. You'll notice I placed the magnets at an angle. That's because this arrangement provides a wider linear range of values compared to just having the magnets parallel to the sensor. The mechanism is 3D printed, but all the important bits are metal. The four extension springs around the mechanism serve to keep it in the center relative to the XY plane. And I also have a compression spring inside the mechanism to also keep the pitch and roll centered. It took quite a bit of iterations to get the mechanism working just right, so I'm quite proud of how well it turned out. Now, due to the way the space navigation feature was designed, I was always going to have this extra bit of space in the bottom section. So instead of just covering it up with a non-functional part, I decided to use that space for another rotary encoder, one with an even higher resolution. So that's one advantage the SpaceNav variants have. You get two high resolution rotary encoders, one in the top section and another one at the bottom. So that's it for all the hardware features of the dial. Let's now take a look at the parts that make up the dial and how they all come together. The dial is made up of multiple connected 3D printed parts that support each other in one way or the other. Each part connects to the next with self-tapping screws, and each part serves at least one specific function. All the parts for the dial are designed and optimized for 3D printing and can be printed with any material you like. I printed all of mine in PLA. Some of these parts need to be printed with transparent filament to allow the LEDs from the dial to shine through. With a little creative printing, you can produce some really cool looking parts. I made the base here by printing the first three layers with purple PLA. The rest of the print is then completed with transparent PLA. I use the same method to print the keycaps.
For the knob, I printed the first three layers with purple PLA. The design inlay was printed with transparent PLA and the rest of the print was completed in silver PLA. You can also have your own design or logo on the dial. I'll have a link to download all the 3D files in the description. The number of parts required to make the dial depends on the specific variant of the dial. The base variant obviously having the lowest part count. It's also the easiest to build. Not that the others are particularly difficult. It's just that more hardware features generally means more parts and more wiring. I did design proper wiring channels into all the parts. So you'll notice the wires are not really visible except for the points where they terminate on the main board. Another method I used to keep track of all the connections is by using individually colored wires. So you'll notice the wires are of different colors. All connection points are also properly labeled. So it's really easy to tell what connects to what. There's also reverse voltage protection on the main board. So even if the connections gets mixed up, it won't damage the components on the main board. I will of course have a full build instruction with detailed steps linked in the description for all the variants of the dial. I'll also link to my Tindy store there. The kits for the dial should be available a week after this video is posted. So that's it for this video. My next video will be all about the Arduino code and the companion app for the dial. I'll be going through all the features of the app and also how I structured the code for the dial in such a way that allows you to fully configure the dial without ever writing a single line of code. If you've enjoyed watching this video and you'd like to see more like it, consider subscribing to the channel and I'll catch you in the next video. For now, bye.